We're here at I on Earth Summit in Abu Dhabi, and we have with us Craig Hansen from World Resource Institute. Yeah, so so Dibberi has a lot in common with the vision here of of, of I on Earth in terms of monitoring social, economic, and environmental developments. So. Uh, for instance, WRI, we have uh, we've co we've convened a lot of partners around a tool called Global Forest Watch, which actually is providing near real time monitoring of what's happening in the world's forests, both near at home and far away. Uh, we also work with partners and have a system called Aqueduct that's actually measuring and monitoring uh, f water risk in terms of demand and supply uh, across 15,000 different water catchments around the planet. And finally, we also have a system called CATE, the Climate Analysis Indicators Tool, which is actually tracking and providing data to governments, citizens, and companies on greenhouse gas emissions at the national level. Well, people live in a place, right? And so geospatial information is really about providing data, information, and insights about the places where people actually live. And so it really is, geospatial data is really at the heart of the work that we do at WRI. And we always, in the analysis that we do, the insights that we generate, uh, we always try to find ways to link it back to the places where people live and the places where decisions are actually made. Dibberi does a lot of work at advancing sustainable cities, which with, the, with more than half the planet's population now living in cities and projected to have a greater and greater share over the next 50 years, you know, how do we design and adapt sustainable cities you know, to Dibberi is one of the big fundamental questions that humanity faces. So we do a lot of things on that. So two all highlights. So number one is we've been involved for more than a decade on designing, helping cities design sustainable urban transportation systems. We've worked in places like Mexico City, Istanbul, and elsewhere to, to design rapid bus transit systems that get people from where they live to work and back again in an efficient manner, in a, an environmentally safe manner, in, in a safe manner, as well as in a low emissions manner. Uh, and you know, given the rapid growth of cities and the need for people to get to where their jobs are in urban centers, designing systems that are compact and efficient through things like buses uh, is really important for urban development. And WRI has, has been a lot of, of design and advising to governments on how to do that. The second area is on designing low carbon cities. A lot of the biggest cities in the year 2100 are just small towns right now or aren't even invented yet, right? We've all heard about the 50 big cities that are coming that haven't yet even been developed. So we're trying to, now there's two ways you can do that, right? You can actually mimic the way that the West has designed cities, end up with a lot of sprawl, a lot of infrastructure that's very high in terms of energy demands, very carbon intensive, or you can actually design cities in a more climate friendly, climate smart, water smart, transportation smart way. And so we've been doing some pioneering work in India and in China through our Ross Center for Sustainable Cities to actually help working with governments and in city designers to design the cities of the future that are, in, that are low carbon, people friendly, and allow people to get to work in an efficient manner. I mean, compared to 30 or 40 years ago, the use of geospatial data by governments in the private sector has grown exponentially. You go to, to many governments today, they will actually have information available in a geospatial manner. They're using geospatial data to inform their decisions. Now, of course, there's a, there's a lot further they can, they can go, right? The technology is advancing rapidly. There's more remote sensing data available. There's crowdsourcing now as a new phenomenon. The technology, artificial intelligence, when it comes to analyzing data, is coming around, around the corner. So there's a lot a lot more they, they, that governments and companies can do, but they are on, on the pathway. And one of the beauties here of the Ion Earth Summit is that it's, a, it's an opportunity for governments and for companies to learn and see, you know, peer around the corner, what's actually coming and how can, they, how can I embed that into my decision making in, in the very near future. Citizens, companies, and governments have the access to data that's geospatial and have the know-how to actually use it, that demand will drive the use in of itself because they will see the power of it 
and the ability of geospatial data to actually to improve decision making. So I think it's going to come through its own demand, natural demand, given the power that geospatial data actually provides. There's a lot of expectations around COP21. We're seeing a lot of momentum building up to COP21. Countries are right now coming out with their INDCs and saying what they're going to do, what's their commitment they're making when it comes to, to addressing climate change. I think, I think in Paris will be another major mi milestone around uh, the movement towards getting governments and companies to take serious action around climate change. But I also think it's another step, right? There's more work to be done even after that. You are, ever since Rio Plus 20, which was only three years ago, right? I think you're already seeing an explosion of the use of geospatial data. The, you know, in, in Rio Plus 20, we did not yet have Global Forest Watch out there, and, and now we do. And other organizations presenting here at Ion Earth actually are showcasing their applications of geospatial data to improve management of natural resources, improve the livelihoods of, of, of people living in a, in a particular place. So you're, seeing, you're starting to see an explosion of this, and I actually think it's going to grow exponentially. I think if you walk around and go to the sessions here today and tomorrow and the next day at Ion Earth, you're thinking, wow, look at all the neat stuff that's happening. But I bet 20 years from now, if you could film this and come back and look at the film, people are going to say, wait a second, that was nothing compared to what we have today, right, in the year 2035. I actually think we're just on the cutting edge of a dramatic explosion of the use of these new technologies for influencing our decisions and influencing behaviors. And I think with, with uh, the COP21, because, because climate also is place-based and the impacts of climate are place-based, and the commitments countries are making are place-based, whether it's on energy or on forest conservation, geospatial data, definitely has a role to play and will be play a very important role in advancing that agenda.